For today's lesson, we're going to take a look at some different types of stroke that can affect the brain. A stroke is a form of a cerebrovascular accident. And strokes in the United States, there's about 750,000 per year. A few of the risk factors that you may already be aware of are increased age, a high cholesterol, because the cholesterol is going to lay down plaques that are going to potentially lead to more clots. High blood pressure or hypertension is going to put stress and strain on the blood vessels and they may in fact break. Smoking, uh, like with many other things, smoking is not good for your brain and it's certainly not good for your blood vessels. Heavy alcohol use is another risk factor. Now research has found that moderate alcohol consumption can actually be somewhat protective uh, and could be helpful to your cardiovascular system. Uh, but this is, uh, we're looking at about two drinks per day for men and one drink per day for women. Anything above that starts to have some negative side effects. And lastly, a sedentary lifestyle. Exercise, as I'm sure you know, is good for your body and it's certainly good for your brain to help you maintain a healthy cardiovascular system. There are two major types of strokes that we will take a look at. The first one is a hemorrhagic stroke and this is you want to think of bleeding um, and so you're bleeding within the brain or bleeding literally onto the brain. The blood is going to leak out of a damaged or broken blood vessel and that's going to cause neurons to die. And that's what we see in the diagram and in the uh, CT scan below, that there is some damage to the brain after a stroke. It doesn't look the same because the neurons have been killed. A second type of stroke is an ischemic stroke. And here the blood vessel is going to get blocked by a blood clot. Blood clots can occur in a couple of ways. One is a thrombus, which is a blood clot that occurs in the place where the blood vessel is already damaged. So there's damage to the blood vessel and the clots are there trying actually to fix it, but then they block it up and then the blood can't flow through uh, to feed the brain. Uh, an embolus can also occur. This is a blood clot that forms from material that starts in one area of the vascular system, uh, perhaps down in your leg, that breaks off and moves until it gets stuck, usually in a small blood vessel or capillary. Sometimes this you hear about um, embolisms in the lung, but certainly there's many very tiny blood vessels in the brain and you could have a blood clot causing some very severe damage in the brain as well. This drawing just highlights what we just talked about in terms of an ischemic stroke uh, showing you where a blood vessel may be blocked by a clot and that the area above that or beyond that blood vessel could be damaged because you're going to block the flow of oxygen as well as glucose to that part of the brain. The effects of a stroke can be rather minor or hardly noticeable or they can be very serious and certainly potentially lead to death. The severity of the effects of a stroke depends in a large part on the size of the blood vessel that gets blocked or that breaks open, as well as the location of the blood vessel. Um, a clot that occurs or a hemorrhage that occurs on the brain stem is potentially much more devastating than one that's going to occur, say, in the cortex. Doesn't mean that you wouldn't lose a lot of uh, function if you had a blood clot or a hemorrhagic stroke in the frontal cortex, but you're much more likely to survive. Again, think about the functions of these different parts of the body or the brain. In the brainstem, we're controlling things like respiration and heart rate, and so if we're going to damage those areas, they're going to be much more vital to our survival. Uh, in addition, we see that the stroke is going to cause neuronal death. And so again, depending on where those neurons are and how many die, are going to tell us a lot about the severity of the stroke itself. We're going to look a little bit more closely at neuronal death during or after a stroke. One thing that we see is increased or excessive glutamate as a result of a stroke. And this leads to excitotoxicity which should make sense given that glutamate is your main excitatory neurotransmitter. 
Now certainly we often focus on the fact that there's um, a blockage of oxygen and glucose that a blood clot during a stroke may cause. But we also need to think about the fact that it isn't just the lack of oxygen or the decrease in glucose that is going to cause neurons to become damaged or die. When we have a decrease in oxygen and a decrease in glucose, uh, what we see is a decrease in the sodium-potassium transporter function, meaning that our sodium-potassium pumps can't maintain the ion concentrations that are necessary so that we can fire an action potential. The membranes will become depolarized, and this leads to an increased release of glutamate. We also see an increase in sodium ions as well as an increase in calcium ions. And these are going to occur inside the cell. And what's going to happen is because there are the more ions inside the cell, the cell is going to absorb water and swell or we're going to have some edema of those cells. And what happens when these cells start to swell is that that attracts microglia because their goal is to attack injured cells and get rid of them. And certainly that would lead to more damage in that area of the brain. Furthermore, damaged mitochondria create free radicals, which are toxic to the cell. So what we see is that glutamate is going to overexcite the cells and cause damage and that the pathway through which oxygen and glucose works are also going to lead to damage to our neurons. We will just briefly look at a few of the treatments that we use to treat stroke patients. The first one are drugs that can be used to dissolve the clots. If you have a clot, then dissolving the clot would help to alleviate that problem. One of the concerns is that some of these drugs can be rather toxic. We can also use anticoagulants such as DSPA, which is from the uh, vampire bat uh, that that animal uses when it, it's attacking its prey. And certainly we can try to take advantage of the qualities of uh, that to help us control or block the coagulation uh, of the blood. There are mechanical treatments that you should have read about in the textbook. Uh, one basically is like a corkscrew which is going to go into a larger blood vessel and try to get a, a hold of the clot and pull it out. And the other one is using suction to suck a clot out of a blocked blood vessel. While treatment is wonderful, prevention is even better. And this goes back to what we saw in the beginning in terms of risk factors. We're going to try to prevent or reduce these risk factors. So in the case of prevention for a stroke, we want to increase our exercise. We want to quit smoking, drink alcohol only in moderation, lower our cholesterol by having a more of a plant-based diet, and reducing blood pressure. We can certainly do that through lifestyle changes, but for some folks that may require medicine. And the goal here is again to take some of the pressure off of our blood vessels and to um, avoid uh, excessive aspects that are going to clot and then allow us to have a healthy, happy brain.